well known that Keynes uh, was a little bit uh, suspicious of socialism. Uh, he thought that the theory of demand uh, pointed to a socialization of investment as the only way to guarantee full employment. But he didn't think that this would require uh, uh, careful uh, control of uh, 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 private spending on consumption or didn't, did not require uh, careful, uh, minute planning. Uh, it's a little bit unclear how you can have socialization of investment on the scale that he suggests without having the government uh, influence in a serious way the, the structure of the economy, but, but on, on some level Keynes thought that the, the market system was, uh, could be made to, to function well if we just managed to manage the level of investment uh, so that it maintained full employment. And in this sense Keynes was much less revolutionary than contemporaries uh, and followers who uh, we typically place among, among the Orthodox, right? If you're a post-Keynesian uh, or a Sraphian, you would, you would place, uh, say, Pigou or Lawrence Klein or Franco Modigliani, you would put them within Orthodoxy. But in many respects, they were much more radical than Keynes in terms of the, the kinds of uh, adjustments they, they advocated for, for the economy. And I'll start by talking about Pigou. Uh, who, you know, among post-Keynesians, and of course uh, it started with, with Joan Robinson and, and Keynes himself, uh, he's, he's on the, uh, the side of the enemies, right? But in 1937, because he never embraced Keynesian, the Keynesian theory of effective demand. But in 1937, Pigou published a short book called Socialism versus Capitalism, and what he tries to do in that book is sort out the, the different arguments for and against uh, the two systems. And he presents a remarkably sympathetic case for socialism on grounds of fairness and on grounds of efficiency. Right? He talks about how uh, we are appalled by the notion of the idle rich. And he says that it is a, it is a grave evil uh, to have a group of persons who derive their income from the ownership of property. Uh, and it's a grave evil because of the false standards it implants in the minds of possible imitators, right? It creates, it sets a bad example, a bad moral example. Uh, people would aspire to be like that. And it's a grave evil because of the bitter sense of wrong and injustice that it creates among the poor, the hardworking poor. So there's a moral argument against um, uh, the derivation of ownership from property. He also argues that income inequality uh, is inefficient. I mean, so this, the central feature of capitalism is inefficient because what it does is uh, it creates a situation in large masses of in which large masses of productive resources are devoted to satisfying the whims of the rich while large numbers of people are inadequately fed, inadequately clothed, inadequately housed, and inadequately educated. Uh, this is inefficient, so, so what it does is it entails a transfer of resources uh, in a wasteful way. Uh, they're used to satisfy less urgent needs and more urgent needs than are, are ignored or neglected. Uh, he's engaging in a little interpersonal comparison of utilities here, but, but he's willing to make that, that interpersonal comparison for the sake of making a case for socialism. So he, he favors uh, income redistribution policies in favor of the, the less affluent. He advocates in this book uh, monetary policy to stimulate demand when the economy runs into a slump. He recognizes that monetary policy may not be sufficient if the slump is very severe. Uh, so in that case, he advocates a fiscal stimulus. Uh, he talks about the advantages that um, a planned economy would have in implementing full employment policies. Now, he puts an anti-Keynesian 
spin on this because one of the advantages he says is that if you have a planned economy you can set wages at uh, levels that will be consistent with the absorption of full employment right you can uh, 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 a planning state can push wages down enough to ensure that uh, uh, that there will be full employment so he's working within this Marshallian framework uh, yet he's advocating um, uh, planning and socialism. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pigou's anti-Keynesian confidence that unemployment could be resolved by a decline in, in nominal wages didn't prevent him from recognizing that the market system is, has some problems as a generator of economic welfare. Uh, he was certainly able to appreciate that some socialization of, product, of production might be a useful corrective for the dysfunctions of capitalism. And in the end, he concludes that if it was within his power to direct his country's future, uh, he would accept capitalism for the time being, but he would modify it gradually in the direction of socialism. And he closes the book by saying, uh, that this gradualness does not imply uh, doing nothing. Gradualism uh, implies action. It's not a polite name for standing still. So, you know, Pigou, uh, who post Keynesians are extremely hostile towards, uh, was in fact a Fabian socialist and uh, in this sense was, was much more radical than Keynes. Uh, in a sense, it's fitting that this argument for socialism was put forth by one of the founders of. Uh, welfare economics, because welfare economics was, uh, in its day, one of the best tools that leftists had for making the case for socialism. Um, you know, this idea. Uh, Frank Hahn uh, has made the point that, that one of the things that mainstream economics shows is that the conditions necessary for a market economy to produce efficient, optimal outcomes are so unlikely to be encountered in the real world uh, that the, the main merit of the theory is to, is to show that, uh, that markets are not efficient and that we need to, right, it provides a rationale for intervening. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the Americans who uh, uh, engaged with Keynes and with socialism. And I had intended to uh, talk about this or discuss this a little bit more, but, but when I started reading, uh, it became evident that not many of the Amer American Keynesians uh, did directly engage with socialism. They, they, by and large, drew the conclusion that, well, uh, with the adoption of, of mainstream Keynesianism, we, we no longer really need to talk about socialism. Uh, Keynesianism itself would uh, rectify a lot of the dysfunctions. For example, uh, keeping the economy operating close to full employment would increase the bargaining power uh, of workers and enable them to maintain strong unions and maintain um, uh, high wages. Uh, so they thought that you didn't really need a wage policy. But one exception is, is Lawrence Klein, who recognized the advantages of economic planning. Uh, his 1947 book on the Keynesian Revolution uh, does contain some brief remarks on economic planning. And they're mainly concerned with the ability of the planned economy to manage the relationship between saving and investment. Um, he says that in a socialist economy, the propensity to save out of personal income tends to be lower than it would be in a, a non-socialized economy. And that's because <coughs> the distribution of income is more equal and because people don't need to worry about uh, the hazards of old age. They don't need to worry about what happens to them if they become sick or if they have to go into a hospital. So people naturally will save less. Uh, and he says the main problem then for the planners uh, in, in dealing with this imbalance uh, is to, uh, to regulate the level of investment. Uh, if, they, if they try for too high a level of investment, 
the disparity between saving and investment will set up inflationary pressures. Um, if the planners have a good idea of the exact shape and position of the savings schedule, it can easily uh, calculate, if the planners uh, have a good idea of the shape of the sh savings schedule, they can calculate the necessary amount of uh, anti-inflation measures that are necessary to, to match up with the, uh, the level of investment. Um, let me quote from Lawrence Klein. In any intelligently run socialist economy,